what we have done is, in fact, learn a set of chromatin states which are defined by combinations of these marks. And we can now start reasoning about promoter states, transcribed states, active intergenic states, repressed and repetitive states across the genome. That allows us to now summarize, for example, the combinatorics of 51 different tracks into just a single annotation for every region. And even though we learned these completely de novo across the whole genome, simply by looking at this type of data, the resulting uh, annotations, which are actually real data shown here, which were learned completely de novo in absence of any sort of gene annotation, um, in fact match the gene exactly. The, the, the different promoter regions are surrounding the transcription start site here. Uh, the different transcribed regions are in fact found along the body of the transcript, and then active intergenic regions are found flanking these active <laughs> transcripts. And then further away from the gene, you have these repressed regions. And what's interesting is that even uh, with a naked eye, a human observer uh, has a hard time figuring out what's different between these regions and those regions. And yet, the tool that we have built is able to actually distinguish them as different chromatin states. So that's a very brief introduction to chromatin states, which enable us to annotate regulatory regions systematically using combinations of chromatin marks to reveal this new language for interpreting many, many tracks together, uh, which we call chromatin states. So we've revealed in a completely de novo way distinct classes of promoters, enhancers, transcribed, repressed, and re repetitive states. And we've used those to reveal new genes, discover long, long intergene non-coding RNAs, uh, new enhancers, as well as interpret uh, uh, intergenic SNPs as possibly having a regulatory role because they're associated with those enhancer states. The picture becomes much more interesting as you start looking at the same state across many cell types. And what it allows you to do is, in fact, start looking for correlated changes in expression in chromatin and in regulatory motif enrichments as you start observing each of these features in many cell types. Uh, and, and there's many different applications that we can do uh, to actually start linking together these enhancer networks that have been previously elusive because enhancers can act at such varying distances from the gene. So we're now using the same chromatin signal but at a completely different scale. Instead of looking at the peaks of chromatin, which you would see from a distance, we're zooming in within these peaks to actually find trouts or dips in the chromatin signal, uh, suggestive of nucleosome displacement associated with transcription factor binding. And indeed, we find blocks of sequence conservation exactly at those dips, validating that perhaps these are the regions that are driving t uh, transcription factor binding. Again, we find that overall the conservation of dips is in fact much stronger than the conservation of peaks across varying distances from the center of either dips or dips, uh, dips or peaks. And we can also find that uh, regulatory motifs are very strongly enriched in the center of uh, those dips, which is not true for shuffle motifs. And if you include conservation, uh, the signal becomes much stronger. And then lastly, those dips are in fact uh, cell type specific. If you look at the motif for OCT4, one of the four major reprogramming factors for embryonic stem cells, for, uh, what you can see is that uh, the, there's no signal associated with dips uh, for the motif of OCT4, of OCT4 for any of the cell types except for H1, embryonic stem cells, again, where the factor is expected to be active. So just to summarize this entire portion, what we end up with is clusters of enhancer activity across the different cell types. So we now have 20-some uh, uh, clusters of enhancers that show the same activity pattern, namely they're inactive in that cell, those two cells, that cell only, and so on and so forth. But what about GWAS? So we've now built this arsenal of tools for interpreting genomes. We've built these chromatin states, which we can apply to discover patterns of uh, combinations of marks and interpret uh, these regulatory regions systematically. We can, we've defined now these activity signatures where we've started linking enhancers to both their uh, transcription factors upstream and to their target genes downstream. And we've started predicting these causal cell type specific activators and repressors. Can we use all that information to start interpreting SNPs that uh, emerge from these disease studies? The answer is yes. Uh, we've taken a number of studies uh, from recently published papers and then we've asked if we, if we take all of the SNPs associated with that study and we line them up one after the other and uh, we look at now the chromatin state annotation of that region associated with the top SNP predicted in each of the different cell types. 
what we're finding is that uh, for each of the studies, a single cell type emerges where all the, or, uh, a large number of the SNPs associated with that study are in fact found exactly in the region that we're predicting to be an enhancer, specifically in KFAB 62 So we've sequenced 29 mammals at the Broad Institute, uh, which we have used to now start increasing the resolution with which we can map constraint across mammalian species. In this particular case, uh, there's an intronic uh, region of a very well-studied gene, which is in fact associated with four little peaks of conservation. And when we look at uh, a binding study with CHIP-CHIP, we find that all of these regions are in fact occupied by the factor. And in fact, the four motif instances of NHRF, of NRSF, which have been uh, associated with the binding of the factor, are in fact age specifically conserved in these regions corresponding to the four peaks of conservation. So we now perhaps have the ability to pinpoint individual motif instances by piling on more and more species. And you can imagine that that power will only increase with increasing capacity for sequencing. And beyond just mapping these uh, regions of selection, we can in fact start mapping the nucleotides under selection for every position in the genome. In this particular case, there's a position which switches from C to G repeatedly, suggesting that in fact the selective pressure is uh, acting for uh, a C or a G as opposed to an individual nucleotide. So we, we're going to be calling these two-fold selection patterns uh, for either C or G, G or A, and any other pair of nucleotides which may appear to be selected across the genome. So how does this mutational constraint that we have measured across mammals relate now to the constraint within the human population? One could argue that perhaps the mutational uh, patterns have in fact changed and there's, uh, there's just different pressures driving human evolution. Well, the answer is that, in fact, the human SNP frequencies very strongly match the pairwise uh, changes uh, that are predicted from mammalian selection. If you look at these uh, sort of 16 by 16, all pairwise combinations of SNPs, what you end up with is a diagonal, where the SNP found in the human population, in fact, matches the, uh, the two-fold selective pressure found across, uh, across species. Let me illustrate with those three examples. First, let's look at this A to G change, which is a transition, which in fact happens much more frequently than, um, uh, than either transversion. And what, means in, in, what you see is that when you have a SNP that changes from an A in the ancestral allele to a G in the derived allele, and then you ask for the probability of that particular, of each of the four letters, Across the mammalian selection, what you find that in, is that indeed uh, that those positions are predicted to be pairs of A and G as opposed to just an A. So basically, the, even though the, the ancestral allele is an A and it has recently switched to a derived allele, uh, a G, in the human population, what you find is that in fact across mammalian uh, history, there have been repeated changes from A to G. But again, this is a transition, so you would sort of expect that. Let's now look at the transversions of A to C or A to T. Again, the ancestral allele is an A, and instead of just finding an A in the mammalian alignment, which you would you know, predict because that's what humans started off with, what you in fact find is that this A to C mutational pattern is severely enriched in frequency compared to this A to T uh, transition. So again, comparing a transition to a transition, even though the two curves match perfectly here, when, when you have a SNP in the human population, you in fact find that this uh, transversion has been occurring repeatedly across the mammalian population. And the same thing for an A to T here, which is severely enriched. Now, th this is starting to be really, really uh, uh, weird. Uh, we can now measure selective pressure solely within the human population. We can, in fact, only from 49 individuals uh, in an initial stage of the 1,000 uh, uh, Genomes Project, we can in fact now start measuring the position-specific selection across all instances of the CTCF motif uh, in the genome and measure, in this particular case, for bound versus unbound motif instances, the observed reduction in heterozygosity associated with every position of the CTCF motif. 